Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of Straight Talk with PAP. I'm Yvonne Chan. COVID-19 has impacted almost every aspect of our lives. So how do we fight this invisible enemy? And beyond COVID, how do we ensure that healthcare continues to be affordable and accessible for all in the long term? Well, here to discuss this with me today are Health Minister Gan Kim Yong, welcome, Thank Dr. You. Lam Pin Min, and PAP's new candidate Zulkarnayan Abdul Rahim. Thank they you. are here to share more about critical health matters with us. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. I would like to kick off today's session with a question to you, Minister. Yes. Um, no doubt, aggressive testing and contact tracing will help us improve the spread of the virus but you've also said that mm -hmm. the fight is ongoing and we've still got a long road ahead um, in spite of that the government has also significantly expanded our healthcare capacity mm -hmm. to cope with future waves of infection can you just give us an update of the status today and what we're yeah. doing to prepare Singapore for the future thank you in fact uh, we have been giving uh, daily updates through our press releases and at the same time we have also held uh, press conferences uh, weekly and sometimes uh, twice weekly in order to keep uh, Singaporeans updated on the progress of this, uh, our fight against uh, COVID-19. Uh, I think it's probably useful to give a quick update. Yes. Today we are in uh, phase two. Uh, I want to thank all the Singaporeans for helping us, uh, supporting our measures so that we are able to open up gradually and safely. And now we are in the midst of uh, phase two. And the phase two will last uh, several months. Uh, it will depend on several factors. But what is important is for us to continue to practice uh, safe distancing, making sure that the precautionary measures are taken seriously. And if each of us uh, exercise um, a caution, I think we will be able to continue to open up uh, progressively and move along phase two and eventually we will reach uh, phase three. So I think uh, at the moment, the community numbers uh, are remaining low. Uh, that's a good sign. But we know from experiences of other countries, when we begin to open up, there will be more interaction between people and the opportunities for this virus transmission will increase. And we do expect to see the number of cases to grow over time. And we hope that uh, with um, a, a more aggressive testing and detection, we will be able to keep the number somewhat uh, lower than what it otherwise would have been. And also to prevent uh, big clusters from happening. If you remember, we have quite a few clusters. One of them is uh, Safra, which uh, uh, have affected quite a number of uh, people. And uh, we want to prevent such uh, events from happening. Uh, these are what we call super spreading events, where one uh, patient may infect 10, and 10 among them may infect another uh, 20. So therefore, it's an ongoing transmission, which we try to uh, prevent. Um, in fact, from this uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, we have uh, seen that uh, it is quite different from what we have seen before. Uh, if you remember, maybe you, you may be too young to remember, but uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it's quite a long time ago. Seventeen years ago, uh, we had SARS, and we learned very hard lessons from SARS. So we started to build cap capacity and capability. One of the key uh, milestone achievement we have made is uh, the establishment of a National Center for Infectious Diseases, NCID. Yeah. And fortunately, the NCID was actually opened just last year and officially opened this year, just in time for COVID-19. So we prepare as much as we can. But uh, with COVID-19, one important lesson we learned is always to expect the unexpected. Every outbreak is going to be very different from the previous one. And after COVID-19, I'm sure there will be new diseases that will emerge and we must prepare ourselves for the next outbreak. And uh, no matter how hard we try, we have to expect that the next outbreak will again surprise us. Mm. So therefore, uh, one very important feature in our system is to ensure that we have the flexibility and the nimbleness to be able to assess the situation and move and change very quickly. COVID-19 is one uh, good experience as well because in the beginning of COVID-19, uh, we knew very little about the virus. We were not sure whether it's more like SARS or more like uh, H1, H1N1. And because scientific knowledge is still very scarce at the time, people are still researching and trying to understand more. Mm. And therefore, I think uh, as, as we gain more knowledge about the disease, we have to change our strategy and our approach to make sure that we are responding to what we know about the disease. And therefore, one constant is the change in our, our, our position and our approach. And we have to keep communicating with people. And therefore, the trust between the people 
and the government and authority, health authority is very important so that we are able to share with them what we know, what we think about and what we would like them to help us do so that we can move together as one country to fight this war. Mm. And I want to also thank our, all our healthcare workers who work fantastically hard and I meet them from time to time. And uh, last week I visited uh, 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 the uh, uh, healthcare workers at our uh, Changi Exhibition, uh, 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 Changi uh, uh, Expo, uh, Expo and uh, uh, talk to them and encourage them uh, as they see the number of patients in the Changi Expo coming down because they are being discharged quite quickly now. Uh, we, I told them to, uh, I thank them for their hard work and also told them to take a breather to make sure they have enough rest so that they are able to sustain the effort. So I think I want to thank them for their hard work. But the uh, journey is still a very long one. It's going to be a long battle. It will take uh, several months, even up to end of the year or maybe even next year before we are able to see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Yeah. But even then, after that, uh, I think the impact on the economy, on the society, is going to have a fairly long tail. It will take uh, many more months to allow us to revive the economy and to put, to restore the, the social and community uh, activities back together. Mm -hmm. So I met uh, many of my uh, old folks uh, as I walked the market, you know. Yeah. And many of them asked me, uh, Mr. Gunn, when can we start the karaoke? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's a very popular yes. uh, activity. activity. Yeah, I said, you know, I also want to sing with you, but unfortunately, <laughs> we can't start yet. Uh, but we do have uh, a sort of a Zoom uh, karaoke and Zoom uh, singing sessions. Nice. And Zoom dancing sessions. So I asked them, you know, uh, try to go online. But we do hope that uh, we can gradually start some of these mm. activities because we do need to have this uh, social connection yeah. between people so I can understand the stress and we hope with the cooperation and support of Singaporeans we can continue on this road of recovery mm. and opening uh, smoothly and safely. Yes, thank you Minister. I'm sure there are a lot of lessons that we could have learned from COVID-19. I would like to ask Azul and Dr. Lam, you know, from your walks on the ground, um, how are your residents taking to this reopening of phase two? Are there still a lot of worries about COVID-19 or are they really um, observing these the, the new measures that we put out to make sure that uh, Singapore reopens safely and we keep the virus at bay? Dr. Thanks, Yvonne, for the questions. If I may just uh, add on to what Minister has said, mm. I think COVID-19 is really a pandemic uh, in the century. The last time we had a very severe pandemic of similar magnitude is actually during the Spanish flu in 1918, and that is uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, we had a few dry runs, so to speak, you know, rehearsals. We have the H1N1. Uh, it turned out to be not so severe. It's just almost like a common flu. Mm. But it sort of helped us to prepare ourselves uh, for the next big pandemic, which is what we are facing right now. I mean, we have been uh, preparing ourselves since uh, the SARS uh, episode. Uh, we have equipped ourselves, we have stockpiled all the necessary equipment, uh, and never have we imagined that you know, a pandemic of this nature will actually happen during our lifetime. But it has happened, and we are glad that you know, we are prepared you know, for this pandemic. Although this is a new disease, there are a lot of things that we are still trying to learn about this disease. But we are you know, changing our strategy you know, to cope and to address some of this uh, new knowledge that we may have along the way. But I must say that Singaporeans are actually uh, reacting to this uh, very well. Uh, many of us are very uh, compliant with the measures uh, that we have uh, implemented. In fact, uh, your question about how is phase two going to uh, affect us and what are the common uh, feedback we, we mm, hear from, sense, yes. uh, concerns we hear from the residents. I think generally uh, it's a similar kind of uh, questions that has been asked, you know, when are we going to phase three? You know, we, are, we want to go back to you know, normality. But unfortunately, I think COVID-19 is going to be with us for quite some time. Uh, I would say that phase two will be with us you know, uh, for uh, quite a long, reasonable period of time. But of course, phase two will have uh, different sub-phases, so to speak. Right. You know. As the, local, well. yeah, as the local community cases uh, remains uh, low, and if the situation is under control, then we may be able to relax you know, some of the measures. For example, now we allow social gathering of about five people. If the situation remains stable, we may relax it to more people you know, in the future. So, yes. yeah. so that instead of uh, just a few friends gathering, it may be maybe 10 or 15 in the future. But we just have to be very vigilant, you know, to continue to uh, practice all the safe distancing measures, you know, hand hygiene, wearing a mask, 
Uh, and if Singaporeans are able to do that, I think we may be able to advance uh, towards uh, relaxation of some of these measures in time to come. Yeah, I'm sure many of us are looking forward to that. Thank you, Dr. Lam So, so it's a crisis and it's all hands on deck. Mm. Um, I see it when I go on the Kopitiam visit, uh, house visit. Uh, Kopitiam, you know, you see people sitting apart, maintaining safe uh, social distancing. And I notice something. Um, when I go knock the, uh, on the doors house to house, um, there will be um, people will put proper signages, um, grab delivery drivers, uh, please leave your packages here, Very, thank you very much, nice messages. So I'm, I'm quite uh, heartened to see that people, are, our folks are taking on board a lot of these measures and, and actually internalizing them and actually putting it into practice. And do you have some hand sanitizers as well? Um, so when I actually met this uncle, right, so he's, he said he missed his uh, grandchildren a lot. I'm sure. Yeah, uh, nothing, nothing uh, replaces uh, human contact and all that. But then he said that he's been through, a, seen a lot of things in Singapore and this he has never seen like this before. But he said that we want to meet them, right? And these are little sacrifices that we make. If we don't sacrifice for what we want now, then what we want will be the sacrifice. So it's all hands on deck. I think policy, government, uh, retail associations, people lining up in, in the queue to NTUC at Lot 1. They're all doing their part. Um, and, that's, and that's very heartening to see. Mm. Um, and I hope uh, he gets to meet more of his grandchildren uh, as soon as we uh, come back to normalcy. Mm. Um, so it, it's really, uh, um, well, my mother always said that, you know, she's Merdeka generation and my father is pioneer. They said that um, we've been through a lot as a country, but in the worst of times, um, the best in us will be brought forward. I think, I think that, that's something that we, we have to hold through. Yeah. And, and we have to work towards. Mm, yeah. So well said. Uh, I think it really takes, uh, for us to get to phase three, it really takes uh, the effort of everybody in society, government, community, individuals, to really play their part. But the good news is um, there's a global effort to develop a vaccine. That's right. And Singapore is also working on that. Minister, do you have any updates on how we're progressing on that front? And when a vaccine is ready, how do we ensure that Singaporeans can have it at an affordable rate? I think vaccine will uh, be a key strategy to protect our population, the global population. And that is, uh, in fact, the ultimate solution to a, a virus like COVID-19 or any other virus. Uh, the challenge is that vaccine will take a long time to develop. Even today, we have a few uh, possible candidates, uh, like uh, very promising candidates are being tested. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the testing itself will take some time. And it, there's no guarantee that the first candidate uh, will succeed. They may have to go through a few iterations, a few modifications to make sure that they are uh, effective. Because for a vaccine, vaccine to be used, there are two important criteria they have to meet. First, they have to be safe. Because you don't want to create a bigger problem by solving this problem. So you may have side effects that may be mm -hmm. more lethal than uh, COVID-19. So first, you have to make sure that they are safe to be used. Secondly, it has to be effective. If it's safe to be used, but unfortunately, it only protects half the population or a quarter of the population, the rest are not effective, then it doesn't provide that uh, safety for the uh, whole population. You will not be able to eradicate uh, the virus. And therefore, it has to be both effective and uh, uh, safe. And some vaccines are safe, but not quite effective, and some are effective, but not quite safe. So to, to achieve both is not the, uh, so easy. So some of the candidates are being, uh, going through clinical trials now and even clinical trials itself will take some time uh, before we are able to conclude that they are safe and effective to be used. Maybe Dr. Lam has more uh, to add. Yeah, to I think one of the common questions uh, many people will ask is when will an effective uh, vaccine be ready? Yes. I mean, there has been news uh, in the United States, in China, that, oh, maybe we're going to have an uh, effective vaccine by the end of the year. Uh, but I think that is a very optimistic kind of uh, prediction. I mean, six months' time for a vaccine yeah. to come about? I mean, if you look at the, the, the history of uh, vaccine uh, creation, it takes years, sometimes decades, you know, uh, for an uh, effective vaccine to be found. But uh, I must say that COVID-19 has sort of uh, accelerated the entire process of uh, vaccine research and uh, uh, manufacturing. And uh, there are many uh, trials going on right now. I think more than 100 
uh, trials ongoing internationally. And uh, many of them are actually uh, using new scientific technology you know, uh, to produce, uh, assess some of these uh, potential uh, vaccine uh, candidates. But like what Minister Gan said, you know, it has to be effective. You know, there are many different antigens within coronavirus. You know, antigens are like protein substances and the antibody must act on a particular antigen that can neutralize the virus. And if you have an antibody that acts on a particular antigen on the virus but doesn't kill it, then it's actually not effective. So there must be a lot of uh, reiteration and an uh, experiment to find out exactly which is uh, the most effective. Even then, you know, if you do it in a small scale trial, it may not work, you know, in the community. So it, it, there is a process, you know, the various uh, stages of trials. But I must say that uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine is going to be different because there is a, a concerted effort internationally, you know, to compete, to race, to be the first to produce this uh, vaccine. And the reason is simple because uh, this COVID-19 has actually affected so many people in the world. I think right now 11 million people have been infected with uh, COVID-19 worldwide and up to maybe more than five, half a million has died as a result. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a, a crisis uh, of a lifetime and if we are able to come up with this vaccine soon, then the return to normalcy like uh, what uh, Zhu and Minister Gan has said, I think will be sooner. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are hopeful and at the same time, you know, we are, we are uh, we, we have to be realistic, yeah. you know. Don't expect a miracle vaccine to happen uh, in the next uh, few months, yeah. all right. And in the meantime, do exercise caution, vigilance, mm. and then follow many of these uh, safe distancing measures. That sort of puts mm. things into perspective. We still have to remain vigilant. So the so we put it out there today, the fight against COVID-19 is still ongoing. We can't uh, you know, rest on our laurels and relax our standards. But at the same time, we also want to talk today about healthcare affordability in the future. I think that's top of mind for many Singaporeans. Whilst we fight against COVID-19, there are other health concerns as well. Mm -hmm. um, how do we continue to keep healthcare costs affordable for Singaporeans, uh, especially the elderly? Because we are also dealing with a rapidly aging population here in society. Mm -hmm. Minister? So before we move on to that, topic, there was a second part of the question about the affordability of the vaccines. Yes. So we'll make sure that they're always affordable for all Singaporeans because this is in the interest of our public health. Uh, the pricing, we will have to decide when the vaccine is available and look at the uh, cost and so on, but we'll ensure that they're always affordable for all Singaporeans. Those who uh, need help, we'll make sure that they get the help. But uh, we also have to bear in mind that even if we provide the vaccine free, mm. for example, uh, Someone's still got to pay for it because pharmaceutical companies are not going to give it to you for free. Yes. So eventually, it has to come from a, a taxpayers' uh, re tax revenues to fund this uh, exercise. So I think it will. When it comes, we will decide uh, how to price it, how to uh, uh, cost it, to make sure that they're always accessible and available to all Singaporeans because this is a matter of public health. Mm. Okay. Now coming to uh, health... Uh, thank you healthcare. for clarifying that, uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now coming back to uh, healthcare affordability in general, yeah. I think first uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, uh, healthcare is not just about COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, beyond COVID-19, in fact, even currently, there are still many other healthcare needs that need to be met, uh, whether it's uh, uh, heart disease, whether it's a chronic disease, uh, diabetes, it's still ongoing. Uh, diabetes doesn't stop just because you have COVID-19. Uh, all this will continue to be challenges, yes. right? So I think uh, we, we have to continue to make sure that the healthcare needs of Singaporeans are met. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in terms of capacity, we continue to build healthcare capacity beyond just COVID-19. We have uh, uh, opened uh, Ng Teng Fong General Hospital, we have opened Sengkang General Hospital, and we are now uh, building a Woodlands Health Campus and uh, we just announced that there are going to be a new hospital in the east to service and support the population in the east. And even beyond uh, healthcare needs, there's also aging population, which we can talk about later. And it's a, a topic that's very close to my heart. I can spend a whole hour talking about it. So better not launch into that uh, not so yet. soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We won't be able to talk anything else. <laughs> okay. yeah, so I think, uh, therefore, it's important to bear in mind that we need to continue to build capability and capacity mm. for the entire healthcare needs, not just COVID-19. And we also have to make sure that uh, these healthcare facilities will continue to be affordable to Singaporeans. Because if you can build and make it accessible but not affordable, then it doesn't serve the purpose. 
And we have been tweaking our healthcare financing system uh, regularly. Uh, so just to give you an example, um, some years ago, uh, 2014, I think, we rolled out MediShield Life. MediShield Life episodes. For the general outpatient care, primary care, for example, we roll out the Community Health Assist Scheme or CHAS. Um, very few people understand what CHAS means, but they know what a blue card is and what an orange card is. <laughs> yeah, so we always talk to my auntie, uncle, and say about your orange card and your blue card. And now we have one more colour, and that's the green card. Yeah. So green card actually covers all Singaporeans, regardless of income, specifically targeted at chronic diseases, because chronic diseases tend to be more costly to manage because they're long-term. Mm. So we try to help them with uh, this green card access. Of course, uh, many of you uh, older ones like me uh, will remember uh, we have a Medica generation package, we have yeah. the Pioneer generation mm -hmm. package. So these are targeted at the older generation. Mm. So we have a scheme to help uh, inpatient, we have a scheme to help the outpatient, the chance cards, and we have a scheme to help the seniors, and that's the Pioneer and Medica generation. And we'll continue to see how we can uh, improve these schemes and to roll out new ones to meet uh, specific needs. One new scheme that's going to come up soon, and that's uh, Casual Life. And Casual Life is focusing on the long-term care. These are specifically for those with a severe disability, mm. unable to look after themselves. They, they, they may need nursing home care, or they may need a caregiver to support them. And this Casual Life is again a universal uh, uh, insurance scheme for, for the younger generation as they grow old. Yeah, so that they are better prepared when they grow old, they, need, uh, they, they become disabled, they need support, then Cash Your Life will then be able to help them. Mm. And for those, those who are already old today, we have other schemes to help them, to support them, to make sure that they are also taken care of, to ensure that they get appropriate care without having to worry about financial affordability. And that's how we operate among with the, uh, the subsidies, with the MediShield Life, with the MediSafe, as well as with the MediFund. We make sure that everyone can afford appropriate health care. Yeah, and Medifan is to help those uh, from needy families as well, right? That's right. Um, Zul, I just wanted to direct this next question to you. Uh, based on what uh, Minister Gan was talking about, you know, you have your eyes and ears on the ground with a lot of the elderly uh, in, your, uh, in your area. Um, what is their, some of their general concerns about uh, health care affordability in the future? Are they aware that there are such schemes available for them to take advantage of? I think by and large, the CHAS scheme has been quite uh, remarkable in terms of outreach. Um, uh, they know about the colours and all that. Green card, uh, orange, uh, and, uh, yes. orange and blue. And orange and blue, <laughs> yes. right? Um, and the, it's the big ticket items, the, the chronic uh, care um, and, and, and the fear and concern what would happen to them. Um, and some of them had not taken uh, insurance before and um, they, they, they shared their concerns with me. Um, I think that um, while we can uh, roll out or, or in give them the information is, uh, in regards to all the schemes, um, we also need to bring them uh, to the and connect them to the relevant uh, medical social welfare fund and um, uh, social service officers who can actually give them the support um, and actually find out besides healthcare, there are other underlying uh, costs or, or, or expenses right, that they are also burdened with. So, um, uh, 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 an example was yesterday when we were at uh, Kat Hong Zone 6 or something like that. Um, then um, she was on, um, the, the auntie was uh, having long, um, huge bills to pay, right? But um, she has already been receiving certain help. Uh, but beyond that, there are other uh, expenses uh, of the household. Um, and we also know that certain families make up a bit different, uh, although they have children who are no longer living with them, some may not have uh, the, the luxury of, of, of having the extra income to, to support their own parents. So the schemes actually help. Um, this is our, our, our purpose, right? I, would, um, I just coined that the thing about um, maybe you don't have to meet the people, you have to, MPS should be changed to GPS, you know, go to the people. So you, in, in your house visit, in, 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 in walking the ground, we find out. Uh, it's, to me, it's not a campaign trail. It's about getting to know uh, the residents, and, and they open up, right? Uh, Zul, uh, I got this, 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 and then uh, we will try to find out, connect. Uh, we don't have all the solutions. We connect them to, to the relevant agencies. In fact, Zul reminded me uh, a very good point. Uh, during the last GE, mm -hmm. uh, one of the points that were raised was that uh, there are many seniors who are home alone, 
and even if they're not home alone, they are with their spouse, but both are quite old. They are not with their children, or some may be uh, childless. So therefore, uh, some of them, although they have many, many schemes, they may not be aware. Yeah. So they are having difficulties, and they are sort of didn't know where to go for help. And that's why over the last few years, we set up uh, this uh, civil generation office, which I think Bimmy can elaborate later on. And the idea of this uh, civil generation office is really to have SG ambassadors. Uh, these are volunteers which go actually house to house. They have a specific list of clients. They visit them regularly, talk to them, understand them, befriend them so that they know them personally and they understand their needs beyond just healthcare. They may have social needs. Sometimes they may have their mental well-being needs. They may, be, they may feel isolated. They need to be connected. And so the job of this uh, uh, SG ambassadors is really to connect them and identify their needs, whether social or medical, and link them to the service providers on the other hand so that they can then be, have the access to the services that we already have. This way we make sure that uh, no one is left behind and no one is left alone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, uh, in, over a period of time, after they have uh, established friendship, uh, they will also be able to bring them down to the community to participate in the activities, karaoke, dancing and so on, which unfortunately we can't do now. But uh, uh, before COVID-19, they were quite active in bringing them down. And we hope in the not distant future, we can again bring them down so as to get them connected to the community rather than to be home alone. I think SGO has done a fantastic job. I also want to thank all the SGO ambassadors, volunteers who have uh, done this work for us. And it's, they play a very important part in connecting the older folks who are alone and isolated to the rest of the community so that we can provide them the support. Maybe, yeah. Maybe? Yes, Yvonne, if I may just add, I think uh, the genesis of SGO actually started off with the Pioneer Generation Package. You know, we have the Pioneer Generation Office. And uh, when the Pioneer Generation Package was introduced, about five years ago, I think in 2014, 2015, uh, we knew that you know, for the elderly who may not be so cognizant of some of these, uh, all the measures that we have introduced, it would be good if we can have pioneer generation ambassadors who can actually go house to house to talk to them and explain to them what are the benefits of the pioneer generation card. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, assess you know, whether there are any special needs within the family that you know, uh, we can refer to uh, whether it's social needs or medical needs, you know, so that you know, the elderly will not left behind in this effort. And as it progresses, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, engaged uh, almost every uh, pioneer generation and then we introduced the Medeca generation package. And these are also senior citizens. And therefore, we have morphed into what we call silver generation uh, office, where the scope is actually much wider now. Because in the past, PGO only looks after pioneer generation. Right. Now, SGO looks after those all senior citizens uh, in Singapore. So it's more all-encompassing. That's right. And with the, the purposes that, that has been uh, alluded by Minister Gan, you know, uh, social needs, health needs, mm -hmm. right? And I think I would want to just uh, bring ourselves back uh, to uh, the role of MOH. You know, a minister has always mentioned Ministry of Health is not Ministry of Sickness. You know, we have to prevent sickness from yeah. happening. Although we have a lot of measures that can uh, ensure affordability of healthcare, I think one of our key uh, aims is also to, to ensure that people stay healthy. And we have been investing a lot uh, in Health Promotion Board uh, to promote healthy living among Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. And we're also going upstream to as young as uh, young children. Uh, through our Nurture SG, is actually a, a task force, the task force that was formed previously to look at the health needs of young children so that you know, we can uh, help them imbibe uh, some of these uh, good, uh, healthy living habits. And hopefully, you know, when they go back home uh, to their parents, you know, they can also share some of these health tips uh, to the parents. And hopefully, by uh, starting early, they will be able to actually continue with uh, this good habit of living healthily uh, throughout the years mm. of their lives. That's a really good point because we're not just about taking care of the sick. A healthy nation is not about taking care of the sick, but really making sure that all our citizens live longer and better lives. And so we want to talk about well-being as well, the yes. well-being of our citizens. And I think uh, the circuit breaker and COVID-19 really brought out a lot of common issues faced by many because it was a shared experience. So we had, for instance, uh, mental wellness issues being brought to the fore because people are dealing with loneliness, um, the elderly or singles. And there's also people dealing with domestic violence and the challenge of work from home 
and HBL at the same time. I know a lot of my parent friends are also, you know, pulling their hair out trying to juggle all that. What more is being done to ensure that uh, the well-being of Singaporeans are being taken care of? Yes, I think uh, uh, specifically for COVID-19, uh, we also noticed that uh, the stress level in the family goes up because, uh, you know, you used to just spend one hour seeing each other during breakfast uh, and, and dinner. dinner. And sometimes you don't see a dinner, you, it's just a, an hour before you go to sleep. So you maintain quite a cordial uh, relationship with one another. But it's quite different when you see each other 24 <laughs> hours a day. <laughs> And you don't even, you're not even allowed to go out. Yeah. You can, there's no place to escape to, mm -hmm. you know, even if you want to have your own private space. So I think we understand the stress level will go up. And so we urge uh, everyone to be more understanding and more accommodating. But at the same time, we, have also, uh, we also understand that uh, mental well-being is very critical. And that's why we have set up a uh, work group on mental well-being specifically under COVID-19. And uh, this is uh, led by IMH, Institute of Mental Health. And uh, Dr. Amy Kaur, Senior Minister of State for Health, is uh, overseeing this piece of work, basically to focus on how we can roll out more programs, engage people to make sure that their well-being uh, is maintained. But I should also take this opportunity, you know, I don't have a lot of opportunity to go on TV, but uh, <laughs> on Facebook to advertise a little bit. Yeah, so we, uh, Tell us uh, what's in store. What yeah, we have a health promotion board, which is focused on promoting health, healthy uh, living. And we have this program called the National Steps Challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say that uh, it has received uh, international recognition. Uh, it is one of the most successful programs in the world. Today, we have uh, about a million people who have signed up uh, for our season five. Now we are into the fifth season. Mm -hmm. And basically, it encourages people to stay active, walk more often, and we are adding more and more features. And uh, it is something that we hope all Singaporeans will sign up. We will remind you how many steps you have taken today. And if you're not enough, please uh, move about, walk more. Particularly if you are staying at home, working from home. Uh, I'm sure many people don't walk more than 1,000 or 2,000 steps a day when you actually ought to uh, do at least 10,000 steps a day. So I think uh, sign up with our uh, National Steps Challenge and stay healthy for as, as much as possible. Mm. So I think Pimin is right that we cannot uh, forget about staying healthy because that's ultimately mm. the best way to keep healthcare costs low. Because once you're healthy, you don't need any healthcare services, mm. you don't, don't need to spend any healthcare money. Yeah. If everybody stays healthy, then our overall healthcare bill will come down. You know what so, they say, prevention is better than cure. That's right. I have another saying, you know, because uh, <laughs> uh, uh, every time I, when, I, when I meet people, they say, oh, uh, I always say, you know, uh, when you are healthy, my job will be easy. <laughs> uh, uh, so the idea is that uh, if you, when you stay healthy, the Ministry of Health job will be much easier. Yeah. In fact, our job is to keep you healthy. Yes. Uh, I thought I'd just oh, yeah, uh, share on. a very interesting yeah. observation during this circuit breaker period. I mean, I understand the stress that many of us uh, uh, may go through because mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, having to, to, to be cooped up at home for a long time. And one of the observations I observed in one of my, one of my pet at home, it, which is a cat. Uh -huh. And I realised that during the circuit breaker period, I mean, all of us were at home, my children were at home, my in-laws were at home. I was at home, you know, uh, working from home. And I realised that the cat became a little bit edgy and very stressful. And that's no because... No personal space. <laughs> you're right. That's because, <laughs> that's because all of us are at home and every time we feel bored, we will pick up the cat and play with the cat. And Poor I was just thing. wondering, you know, Poor I thought creature. the cat should be happy, yes. you know, when all of us are home. And I found out and I did a Google check and found out that actually the cat needs about 15 to 16 hours of sleep. <laughs> and because of our presence at home, you know, the cat didn't have enough sleep. And then, you know, when it comes to the night time, wow, he was, she was always so tired. And then. <laughs> so it was a very interesting observation. Most poor creature. Yeah, you don't realise that pets and animals too also need yeah. their space, right? Uh, let alone humans. Yeah. Uh, Azul, I just, I, I just want to bring it back to the point where a uh, minister talked about National Steps Challenge. I mm. saw you nodding emphatically. You are signed up of that as well? You've signed yes, up? I am. My firm has, uh, has signed up for the Corporate Steps Challenge as well. I think we have seen how uh, over the years uh, people are a bit more active. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think um, our percentage uh, in, uh, of uh, persons or in terms of population have increased to 35% uh, who are engaging in at least three 
uh, three times a, a week of intense activity that includes like 30 minutes of jogging, running. Um, and, I, and, and we see it, we see it in our, our, our residents, right? Uh, they ask for fitness corners, um, uh, multi-generational facilities, which we are building in Chua Chukang as well, a mega playground uh, where people can mix, mingle, uh, and then also do the exercises. Um, to me, aging well means also being well in terms of well-being. Mm. And, and it's actually the connectivity between uh, humans, right? Um, when I volunteered in a crisis shelter home, we saw during the circuit breaker uh, that there's a spike in terms of uh, intimate uh, partner violence, domestic violence, family violence at home. So we, we then reached out to, uh, to neighbours because previously we could live in, uh, in a setting where we have opportunities to meet with neighbours. Our lifts do not stop on every floor of the flat, you know. I remember mine was first, sixth and tenth floor. It's a 12th 12 floor. So you can actually have the opportunity to meet other folks, other neighbours, ask them how they are doing. Um, but now we don't have that. So we need to be a bit more connected, tuned in, and we coined this eye care acronym and we're working with the ComCare and Social Care uh, hotlines. I meaning uh, inform, C meaning connect, A be alert, R right, right dis distancing, uh, E, and show empathy. So some people say it's IK polar, but, <laughs> but it's not being careful or busy body, right? But it's actually being, uh, being aware, uh, being tuned in, plugged in to, mm. to, to the ecosystem, to the, to the family unit, to the environment. So we see that as part and parcel of our collective responsibility. Our health, our mental well-being is actually better. I mean, prevention is better than the cure. Yeah. Absolutely. That's going to be our tagline for today. Mm. Uh, okay, we're going to take a question uh, from our Facebook audience, and this one comes from Sheena Ling. She says, thank you for bringing up the distinction between Ministry of Health, because Ministry of Health is not Ministry of Sick. And uh, with that, what are the upstream plans with regards to mental health? Because mental health is still deemed as a sickness. I think if you may uh, just add, uh, this is a very, very good question. Mm. I think... Uh, um, many people have always been talking about, you know, how do we ensure the mental well-being of Singaporeans? Uh, especially, you know, uh, we live in a very uh, stressful kind of a environment. environment, you know, from work, from studies, you know, from, you know, personal relationships. And uh, all this while we have uh, been uh, looking at uh, the mental uh, health uh, blueprint. I think IMH has been uh, very active in reviewing some of these uh, blueprints. At the same time, we also found that uh, some of these programs are actually quite fragmented in the past, okay, where you have uh, different groups of people, VWOs, uh, MOH, IMH, and then the social services uh, looking at mental health, all from different angles. Uh, just give you an example, you know, uh, when I was in Nurture SG, we were also looking at mental health uh, uh, for the young. And then at the same time, we also receive uh, uh, news that there are also many other VWOs looking at mental health for different uh, selected groups. So with that in mind, uh, we have actually formed a multi-ministerial multi task force that is led by uh, Minister Desmond uh, Lee, who will actually try to bring everybody together to look at mental well-being uh, holistically. And this was actually formed just last year. Uh, work is in progress. And uh, I believe the task force will be able to come up with a very good recommendation so that we can address uh, mental, well -being, well, mental well-being from a very holistic and very preventive uh, uh, perspective. Mm. From your walks on the ground as well, uh, this mental well-being, it affects all ages, isn't it? Mm. Not just uh, exactly. a particular mm. uh, age group. That's right. And in fact, uh, uh, the genesis of this uh, task force is that uh, we look at there are different aspects of uh, mental well-being and the mental challenges uh, in our population. Mm -hmm. And we see that y the young have their own challenges, mm -hmm. uh, uh, stress from uh, uh, their studies, their school, their home, and even uh, BGR issues. And we are also looking BGR at... BGR uh, issues. <laughs> you know, it, it does, it happens. Yeah. And when we get into the young adults, they have their challenges about uh, uh, their studies, their uh, uh, career prospects, prospects, career prospects. Yes, yes. And when you come to adults, they worry about their jobs and uh, families. They get married, they have children, they're stressed. Uh, and when you get older, you need to take care of your, 
the seniors, your parents, the, uh, the stress is also always there. Mm. The mental uh, well, wellness uh, is always, uh, there's always a challenge. Therefore, we decided that instead of uh, having the MOE looking after the school's problem and the uh, MOH looking at the uh, medical side and so on, better to have a multi-agency uh, uh, task force that look at this issue holistically mm. over all age groups. They may start with a particular area of focus, then over time then they expand to other areas and they do it systematically. Okay. And this way we make sure that we don't miss out anyone. We have a comprehensive plan to make sure Singaporeans will have a good uh, mental wellness. So this is led by uh, Desmond Lee, mm. so that he uh, coordinates all the efforts uh, of the, all the ministries. And every ministry sends our own uh, 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 representatives to make sure that we provide the input. And the, the task force also wants to consult quite widely to get inputs from people uh, uh, who are affected by mental wellness issues or even professionals who understand uh, mental wellness. We welcome their inputs, their ideas, yeah. and how we can uh, develop a national plan mm. to keep Singaporeans uh, well. And uh, last year, uh, uh, before COVID-19, I made a visit uh, to uh, uh, various countries to also study uh, the mental uh, wellness in how do they go about ensuring mental wellness among the population in these countries. I yeah. visited the US. Uh, mental wellness is also a key uh, issue of concern. Uh, within the US, among their healthcare professionals, their ministries. They're also debating and discussing how they can ensure uh, uh, the services are there, are adequate, and support the mental wellness of their population. Mm. I think there are many things we can learn from each other, yeah. and uh, we'll be very keen to get uh, views and inputs. Uh, from uh, Global like, uh, China, well. and you have any ideas, please yes. uh, let us know. We'll be very happy to uh, take them in and so that we can have a more comprehensive plan to go about doing it. I mean, this ties into the Emerging Stronger Conversations, right, mm. where the government wants to partner with uh, our citizens to come up with better solutions so they can really hear firsthand what people are looking for uh, on the ground, the everyday citizen. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, I, I also just wanted to ask uh, uh, Dr. Lam this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, you did send me some questions earlier because there were some pressing questions uh, from some of your residents and I wanted you to debunk some myths for us uh, today. And uh, one of the questions we had regarding COVID-19 was, uh, before we close the session, is uh, what sort of supplements can help fight COVID? <laughs> mm. Because we are waiting for a vaccine, it's going to take some time, so what can we do in the uh -huh. meantime besides wearing masks and social distancing? So be besides all the safe uh, management measures that we have uh, emphasized yes. many times, you know, uh, there's also been a lot of myths about you know, what you can eat to prevent uh, COVID-19. In fact, there were some YouTube videos that I saw where onions, you know, can onions. Be, onions can be used to ward off uh, COVID-19 infection and all kind of uh, secret recipes out there. But I must say that there really isn't any uh, scientific evidence uh, to many of these claims. I think most importantly, one has to stay healthy. Uh, you have to make sure that your immune system uh, uh, is in tip-top condition. Uh, if you have a sleep deprivation, then definitely your immune system will, will go down. So it's important to eat healthily. So supplements like vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, some people believe, like minister believe in ginseng. Uh, I do. Uh, I believe well. a little bit in uh, cordyceps, you know, okay, although cordyceps. there is really no uh, uh, specific uh, scientific evidence to say that you can ward off uh, COVID-19 but I believe eating them or taking them in moderation can help you know uh, with the immune system mm -hmm. but please do not go overboard you know to, to take excessively because I think anything in excessive amount can have a, a counterproductive effect mm. yeah. and it yeah. just lead um do things that you enjoy as well. So I think for a minister, it would be karaoke and ginger. <laughs> because he's mentioned karaoke about three times. I think he has a personal pet. You, you personally like it, your but karaoke session. I must tell you a story. Uh, as I was doing the walkabout, uh, one of my uh, 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 grassroots leaders had me a flask and said, uh, say, drink this. So I said, what is this? Yeah, what is it? He said, this is uh, vitamin Y. I said, what's vitamin Y? I haven't heard of that. I know A, B, C, D and so on, but I haven't heard of vitamin Y. He said, this is vitamin Yosim. Uh, Yosim means a ginseng. <laughs> so I said, okay, vitamin Y. Uh, I, I take it because it's a, a goodness for my uh, Agasu leaders. Mm. And I also take Sweet. ginseng uh, uh, every uh, other day uh, quite frequently because my mother-in-law prepares it for me. Wow. So, wow. so it is something that you 
must take and cannot refuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's very your important. Yes. <laughs> yes, and I'm very grateful to my mother-in-law who faithfully uh, pro uh, prepares this for me uh, almost on a daily basis to deliver to my house to make sure that uh, I, I, ha I have the sufficient energy uh, to, to manage uh, uh, the various issues. Zul, what is your secret recipe for staying healthy during this time? Well, I, I'm a creature of habit, so I'm, I stick to a certain ritual and routine. Mm -hmm. um, water, lots of water, exercise, I need to run. Um, my knees are not that great, so I do the elliptical. Um, and um, basically, multivitamins and essence. So taking time out for yourself to exercise That's as right. well, you, right? You, I mean, we think that maybe exercising keeps you fit. Um, it may not keep you healthy, right? But it actually gives you um, space for yourself to think, uh, to actually be in the zone. Uh, when working from home, you don't get that time to commute, you know? So you don't get to sit on the MRT to think, listen to music or read books. You start sitting on the computer and work. So you really need some time to yourself. You need to make time uh, for yourself, for your family, and give them space. Um, everybody needs space, even the cat at home. <laughs> so I think, I think it's, um, it's a lesson for all of us. I yeah. think for Sheena, we never discount the fact that everybody has something to, to contribute, right? Everybody has uh, an idea, which ha this is all hands on deck, I mean, in terms of health and wellness mm. being. We, we, we do stick to our own routines, but maybe Sometimes you need to fact check some of the WhatsApp that are forwarded to us, you know, about COVID cures and yes. all that. Yeah. So many of that going on. Uh, gentlemen, I would like some closing remarks for you, uh, for, from all three of you with regards to this question, right? In 2018, Singapore was ranked seventh in a global well-being league table, and we were the only non-European country in the top 10. I would like to ask, when it comes to our health and well-being in 2020 and beyond, how do you think Singapore will fare. We'll start with you, Dr. Lam. I think uh, we, we, we pay a lot of emphasis on uh, keeping Singaporeans healthy. I think this is uh, the mission of uh, uh, the Ministry of Health. Uh, I think all these uh, in indices and uh, ranking, you know, it really depends on how, you know, uh, the methodology, you know, of uh, the ranking is being done. But importantly, I think uh, the Ministry of Health has been investing a lot uh, in our healthcare system, we have been building uh, new infrastructure. Uh, we ensure that you know healthcare remains affordable, and at the same time, like I mentioned, we want to make sure that you know going upstream, we want to keep people as healthy as possible, and promoting all the healthy uh, eating habits, exercise, and we'll do whatever we can to keep Singaporeans uh, safe and healthy. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Lam. Zul. Well, I'm reminded of this IMH study where it says that uh, one in seven of Singaporeans actually suffered or faced or experienced um, mental um, uh, illness or some tragic event in their lifetime, right? Uh, and that impacted them. Um, to me, it's not about the ranking. It's about the person and individual. One person committing suicide or suffering to depression is one too many, perhaps. Um, we need to, although we cannot save everyone, cannot help everyone, we can certainly try to. We can certainly have all the legislative framework, the policy, the places, into the infrastructure, and the human connectivity. But um, the ranking, I think we, I think Dr. Lam actually said it quite well. I mean, it depends on the methodology. Yes, of course. But actually, it's actually um, the person who we are helping. Anyone that's falling through the crack, crack right, uh, is one too many. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Um, I think what is uh, most important to me. Mm. Uh, actually is uh, our seniors. I think we don't uh, have an international ranking for seniors so far. I, I, I'm not sure any organization does that, uh, but I'm focusing a lot on seniors because uh, partly I'm growing old and partly uh, because uh, we have an aging population. Yes, we do. Yeah, so I think uh, maybe I, I, I say a few words in Mandarin, uh, particularly seniors because of a lot of uh, seniors uh, who are Mandarin speaking. We are very 还是我们的老人家，我们常常都说，呃，人民是我们最重要的资产，其实老人家是我们最重要的宝贝。What uh, it means is that we uh, really uh, put a lot of emphasis on our people because it's our only resource. But in fact, among the people, the seniors are our treasures, and we really want to take care of them, to reach out to them, to support them, and help them. 
We want them to not just live through their uh, silver years, but we want them to actually have an exciting and meaningful and fulfilling uh, senior years so that it is a grand finale, not just a, you know, a fading away. So we want our elders to be this is in a nursing home. What it says is a celebrate life. So I think uh, aging is not just a journey towards an end. But aging actually is a process. It's an exciting journey that we hope we can embark on with our seniors. So we want to roll out many programs to support them, help them, look after their health, make sure they're healthy, active, and they can enjoy an exciting and meaningful life even as they age. I think uh, this will be one of the key focus areas of the Ministry of Health in the past, now, as well as in the future. Absolutely. I think, Minister, you're right. You say we could have another conversation uh, on the longevity and ageing in Singapore. You can tell that you are really passionate about this, and there's so much that we could talk about that. Unfortunately, I have to let you go for lunch. That's what I'm told. I'm sure you're <laughs> going to choose something that's very healthy today. Um, but, gentlemen, once again, thank you so much for your inputs. I enjoyed our conversation, and I wish you all the best uh, in the next few days in the run-up to GE 2020. Thank you. And, thank of course, you. I wish you all good health, and good health to all our online, uh, on our online audience as well. Uh, this, I'm Yvonne Chan. I will see you for the next episode of Straight Talk with PAP. Thank you for joining us this afternoon.